everyone to this episode of Your Freedom Hub's Free Market Cash Patient. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with my co-host, Charles Froman. We're very excited you're here tonight. We are being sponsored by the Marketplace for Health, Wealth, and Freedom, and we will take a look at that in a minute. And and the key is what we're trying to be here is is the disruptor's intersection. All those people with those cutting-edge ideas that are trying to make the world a better place, we're here to help them get showcased and help create some synergies. Now, in case you had noticed, there's a problem in the healthcare world. And, and we're really keen to try to help resolve it. And not only is there an actual physical problem, but there's also a lot of informational problems too. And not everybody's up to speed on what's accurate, what should I do? Do I go with the herd? Do I go my own way? You know, that type of thing. So it's, it's a challenge out there to be sure. And then to help facilitate this, we're working with a award-winning app, which is able to make you find a cash doctor and you can pay them in cash at special pricing and everything. So it's, it cuts the whole third party mentality away. We've got a special site set up for it. It's called Wow. And it's kind of like the Amazon for booking doctors and stuff. So it, it fits into the theme of tonight similarly, because once you've got cash on hand and you want to see doctors, how are you going to go find them? We want you to definitely visit the website. These Both these web addresses take you to the exact same place and to take a look at it. And, and I'm excited because I'm going to take you over here to show it to you on what I discovered is the cool new browser out there that lets you ditch Chrome and all those other creepy follow you around type browsers. And to give you an idea, I went to experiment with it and I went to the place I do some banking at. And lo and behold, the thing has a little warning. It's telling me that it's blocking on this site that this thing was using motion sensors to monitor me. I didn't even know the bank was doing this. So brave.com, you might want to check it out if you want to kind of break out of the mold a little bit. So anyway, let's go over the website as I promised. There's an awful lot to look at here. As you'll see, there's a lot of great drop downs and a lot of good information. You'll want to come sift through here. Under the home tab, you'll see it says webinars and continuing the conversation. The continuing the conversation is quite important to click over there for a quick minute. What's important about it is that these talks typically generate interest and, and a desire to kind of help further the cause or get involved or participate in one way or another. Here's your way to do so. You can connect with all the speakers of the past and get involved with them in a more aggressive fashion, which we really would encourage you to do. Similarly, under this freedom tab, fighting for our freedom, we definitely are featuring some action items. All these things are things that are pressing right now, so you really need to react to all of them as opposed to one or the other. And then down here, you'll see this is an, a growing list of organizations, so you can find out about others that are trying to make some positive things happen. Well, let's sit back to the webinar aspect, kind of where we are tonight. So if you click on the webinar tab, you end up over on this particular page. And there's a little descriptor of what we're doing. And then there's a breakout on the morning or the earlier afternoon one and the one we're at tonight. A little further down shows you the upcoming guests. And most importantly, when you get near the bottom here, these are the links to watch the preceding episode. So this one today will be posted there by Monday. As an example, if we click on this Bright Theon tab, here we go. So you'll see this is a good representation of the breadth of who's been on this show over the years. And you'll find in the op, top left corner, will be today's speaker will be occupying that corner there. So on that note, let's dive into today. And I'm going to have Charles do the honors and introduce today's guests. Gladly, Jeff, and welcome, Brock and Melinda. Um, <clears throat> Jeff and I met Brock and Melinda, a dynamic duo of all kinds of innovations a couple of years ago. Uh, via uh, other friends that we had known over the years and the movements that Jeff and I circle in, whether it's uh, liberty politics or disruptive entrepreneurship. Um, Brock is, sounds like a polymath. He's been involved or still is in, involved in so many interesting uh, disruptive ventures, whether it's defending Earth from errant asteroids or figuring out how to ranch fish in the oceans, uh, creating interactive television, 
and also uh, voting by phone. Uh, so apart from that, he, over the decades, has been figuring out how to empower the middle class, especially those with incomes that aren't as regular as they might like. And in my research of this, apparently with Jack Kemp, the HUD secretary for Bush the Elder, Brock's pay-as-you-go idea uh, intrigued Secretary Kemp, who was trying to figure out how to privatize some public housing stock. And Jack came back to Brock again when he was uh, working with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, liked the idea, apparently, even for his big health reform push in the early 90s. But it was killed by Hillary, who had her own ideas, but it's still a good idea. In fact, as Republicans stress about losing elections, partly over health care, perhaps what Melinda and Brock outlined tonight could be their saving grace. If you have erratic income for the gig, gig economy, that's going to be a big problem. Maybe paying as you go is the way to get more universal coverage. So that's my intro, Jeff. Quite Compelling at that. Well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to give you guys the ability to take back control of it. Okay. Well, when Brock first told me about what he had done, I have to tell you, I didn't believe him. It wasn't until he pulled out these musty old folders and I looked at them and I said, oh my gosh. And as I read through them, I realized that he was absolutely right. But, you know, for me, I'm I research everything and I went back and I took a look at what he had said because it was so incredible. And I realized it was absolutely true and that a million people had come to the United, to the then colonies before the revolution because of what? A financing tool. And I honestly, I think most of us think there's only one kind of financing tool. But what I found out was that that was very wrong. There had been one that had been the standard for America, and that was, um, it was percentage as you earn. You would borrow money in England, you would get tools, you would get tools, you would get passage across the ocean, you would get a, a grub stake, and you would then start paying it back as you earn the money. And that could take a while. But astonishingly, I kept reading and realized that there was absolutely no record of anybody not paying it back in its entirety, which also included interest. They were making a very good profit on these loans. So for a lot of things that answered it. And then Brock and I started talking about the healthcare. And I realized it was exactly the same thing. And the, the, this charging tool, percentage as you earn, could be used also for medical care. And I don't know how much you've heard about what happened when Hillary decided she was going to take a firm fascist sort of control of the health system in the United States with her 298 um, boxes of information and goodness knows how many experts to tell you what you could have. But she wanted that rather than have people being able to choose for themselves. And I'm talking about it, but who you really should be listening to is Brock. So here he is. I, I would say the definition is more like national socialist. Uh, a, a great number of libertarians and conservatives, they, they seem to know the enemy very well, but they don't know American history. Uh, what Melinda is alluding to is basically people wound up coming to America for 7% of their income for seven years. And they were entrepreneurs or craftspeople, farmers mostly. And uh, the tools, the shovels, the plows, uh, if you had six kids, you had to feed them for a year before they got hungry. Uh, and uh, the crops grew. The 
crops were often turned into, say, corn was into corn liquor, and they'd ship 100 barrels. And if you look at the manifests in early America, and you ask, how did we get our freedoms? It comes from shipping seven barrels and BOE, bound for England or Holland or France. The other 93 barrels were free on board, FOB. And as you look at the same names and these two amounts on whatever was being shipped, what they were paying for was their immigration. And these people called themselves redemptioners of debt. And the people they were paying were merchant adventurers. And they ventured their capital. They believed in the advent of a new age, interestingly enough, without lords and ladies. And most of the charter companies, if not all of a hundred of them that founded New England, New France, New Amsterdam, and some of the Southern ones, refused any titles of nobility. And this key point ended essentially primogenitor, genitor, or real estate and other things. The crown, uh, King James got involved with slavery, the Royal African Society, uh, and uh, oddly enough, John Locke was one of those stockholders uh, in 1619. But 1617 is when percentages you earn finance of immigration started. By the American Revolution, the rates were down to 3% of your income for seven years. And uh, 1 million of the 1.5 million people that immigrated before that time came that way. The other 500,000 either had money or they were kidnapped from Africa. So. The southern colonies were crown colonies, uh, whereas the northern colonies were charter companies. And they worked well with the Indians. And indeed, they, it's, there's a great case that they learned this from the Algonquin speaking people, where they asked for trading rights, hunting rights, everything was 7%. So you caught 100 fish in a lake, you owed the tribe seven of them, simple as that. And it worked from there just fine. It got into justice. It got into privateering, fighting the British. We fielded uh, 792 ocean crossing privateers that captured 3,100 British Empire vessels. Uh, mountain men, country doctors later, uh, all used this method. The, uh, the whole idea of paying a judge, a rich man and poor man, each paying a percent of their income before the case was heard gave us free market judicial systems, things like the Supreme Court and all the constitutionalists like to refer to is, well, why don't you ask yourself what kind of freedoms were there before the constitution? What were we fighting for, not against? And what they'd created in early America was a remarkable set of flexible methods or victims of crime could be uh, have restitution by a percentage of income, uh, immigration, you name it. It was all solved. And at that point, uh, it was well into the 1800s before uh, Melinda had researched the British uh, bankers got together trying to end debtors prisons because everybody had gone to Australia or America and they wanted to make everybody in England and anybody else debtors and turn all of England into a debtors prison with installment payments where you didn't own anything until the last payment. And you have a little bad luck of six months worth of, of uh, illness or an economic downturn and they would seize everything you have. Rip and strip of equity is what uh, Melinda calls it, RIP, rigid installment payments, RIP. And that's not good RIP if you're trying to do it. Shall we say healthcare? RIP has another meaning. Well, I was astonished when I saw what had happened with RIPs because, of course, it explained what happened in every downturn that we've had because that's exactly what you saw with real estate. But what we're seeing with medicine is something that everybody today is very concerned about because what we're seeing is a system being eaten alive by government and the people who receive preferential treatment from government and create the regulations that keep you from having the thing that may actually save your life. And 
the met this medical system is completely um, um, morally bankrupt because it puts all of the control in somebody else's hands it delivers you to serfdom and you don't even necessarily think about it that way but that's exactly what's happening so when i looked at this it immediately occurred to me that the only solution was to go completely free market and fortunately i would had the experience and in, in, even independent of brock of watching people decide that they were going to become healers and find ways around the system and provide those services at affordable prices but then at the same time we had also been working on a system for mutual insurance now mutual insurance if you have 10,000 people in a general population anybody in that system can have anything that they want there aren't any limits you don't have anybody deciding you can have this we don't think that's all right we're not going to this person isn't licensed to practice medicine even though they're an eastern practitioner who has been doing acupuncture for you know all of their life and save people's lives uh yes maybe this would cure post-traumatic stress disorder but because we're not going to license it you're not going to have it another example is hyperbaric oxygen therapy works you're not permitted to have it generally because it's not in your area or they're not going to prescribe it for what you have so how do you do that you have a mutual insurance company that's member owned and you can have anything you want because with people putting in a percentage of their income and they check off and decide what they want to have covered or they decide they want to have comprehensive they can do that and it's affordable for everyone you don't need uh, an entire nation or a planet medical statistics are you have ten thousand people in a group you've equaled the statistics of a larger group so whether you're the elks catholics atheists anonymous you just sign up on a computer first come first serve and you're part of that group uh, the group can be larger than ten thousand, certainly uh but that's what a mutual insurance company is what we're doing is with percentage of income financing of pre-existing conditions you have economic incentives for epidemiology what government likes to call public health what old country doctors when they made their rounds in their horse and buggies and I was, you're just looking in the storage of my grand grand aunt naomi who is a nurse with a horse and buggy doctor and uh, she uh, would uh, confirmed some of my research, but because she was there, she used the Socratic method on me. She says, well, what do you think that buggy was for? And it didn't have much of a buckboard. I said, well, it can't be an ambulance or weren't any hospitals and there was no place to take anybody to. She says, that's right. She says, now, when we pulled up to a farmhouse, what do you think was the first thing we did? We might have a newfangled x-ray machine in the back, but and we're there to set a broken leg. But what the doctor would do is he would reckon, as in reconnaissance. He would also then reckon calculation. What's he looking at? A chicken coop. He would charge a poor farmer two chickens for exactly the same broken leg that the next farmer over has got a busted leg because both of them wrecked it on their fence line. The other fellow's a rich farmer. He's going to charge him 25 chickens exactly the same price this is not barter a few years ago there was a candidate named sharon angle in uh, nevada who thought the echoes of the past was barter let's let's trade chickens for a brain surgery she didn't get it bill Mahler, the comedian made a lot of fun of her she probably lost the election to harry reid because of that well i called up that campaign he says well you kind of got it half right you're not quite it's not barter, it's a percentage of income. If you were a townie, you paid cash. And typically it was just about somewhere between seven and 9% of income, uh, generally 10, uh, equivalent to God and the tithing in, in the opinions of some people. 
Today, we've learned that 42% of medical costs and higher education costs, when they're guaranteed and subsidized by governments and taxpayers, the price keeps rising. The price is now 42% higher than the market rate would be in either education or medicine, far above the cost of living increases for the last, my whole lifetime, I'm 66. Now, keeping that in mind, if you drop the price from 17% to 24%, where most people are paying government subsidized medicine levels now, even in the 35% of the free market that's left of it, it would go down to pretty near 10% for an individual or for a family, perhaps 14%. Now, those are real statistical numbers, econometrics, statisticians, actuaries can all confirm this. Once you understand that, all of Hillary's national socialist boxes for pleading need, I needed, let me live. No, you don't need to do that. It's what you need and what you want. You want an Iron Man suit? That's 3% of your income for the next uh, five years. You can lift I beams all day on a construction site, and make a lot more money. And if you just happen to be a person that usually is in a wheelchair, well, go to Sarcos Raytheon and see what they can do for you. And your group plan would pay for that as a personal income improvement investment, PIII. Uh, for vaccines and other preventative care, it's now in the medical providers' self-interest and any medical investors' self-interest to guess what? Keep you healthy, keep you earning, or certainly if you're a retiree type, alive to enjoy your pension. They're not going to be making money off of you hacking and chopping on you as a primary method or sousing you in drugs where you can't even work, much less think. Now that's a total reversal of the mission of medicine. And yet the companies providing it are still trying to save pennies. They're still trying to use 16 different methods of management. But the simplest economic way is not for just the middle class. It includes all the poor. It may not include in America 7% of people who are uneducatable. However, there's pride industries and others that put many such people on assembly lines where they can earn their pay, they can earn their way for a van to take them to work, and they have their own money. The poor, the working poor, uh, all can in ups and downs. If you have a pre existing condition, and that's 133 million people in America, and that's preventing you from working at your optimum level, well, it's in the self interest of the medical empire that you might be dealing with, then to get you to where you can think, where you can use your leg, whatever the problem is, it's solved. Money goes in and you earn it and money goes out and the cycle is there. Instead of a Soviet medical cycle, you have a free market cycle, but it's not based on need, it's based on both need and want. And that's kind of the key feature here. Well, actually, the key feature is that it is free market. And free market is actually the system that best goes along with Christianity. Because if you're not forcing people, but you're providing a system that allows them to actualize and be you know, what the best that they can be and improve themselves, and that's what the system with percentage as you earn does, then you're helping them in a very immediate and real way. It isn't charity because they retain, everybody retains the dignity of knowing that they're paying a percentage and they can improve their lives. They can do things with their lives that may not actually even generate as much income, but they are things that we need done and that we want to see done. And Early Christianity had a, a system that was very interesting that way because if there was a, a, say, an epidemic and those were just, they happened all the time in the Roman Empire, the way that Christians handled it was they would heal, they would take care of, give uh, very basic care to everybody they could reach 
while pagans would simply run away and because they were afraid of catching it and let them die. And that's, of course, one of the ways that at, um, after 200 years, you start to see there be 30, you know, 30 percent of Roman citizens were Christians because they had it right. You care about others and you take a look at the system that you have to ensure that that makes sure that people are not subjected to predatory behavior. And what we have now with rigid installment payments and what they're forcing us into with all of the health systems that exist is forcing us to make choices that we don't want to make ourselves. And we don't want to see other people decide that maybe they're not, they're not going to have this, they're not going to have that because they have to pay for this when we all remember what happened with hemp. Hemp can heal. There are so many things out there that are less expensive. If you have access to it and you know that it works, why can't you use it? And that's one of the reasons that a component of our plan is interactive television. For a moment, imagine a television show where people are trying things that you'd heard about it, but you didn't believe it really worked. And there you see it working and you realize that's a, a solution that will work for you. And you go to your um, safety net health mutual and you say, I want this for this problem. There's no problem. You don't have to ask. You just go get it and it's paid for. One, one of the key things that she's talking about is this isn't just an idea. Uh, this started with Milton Friedman and some of the terminology we're using, like human investments. He liked that. I invented the word financiarance. One of the problems with the so-called Affordable Care Act was it was holding guns to insurance companies and saying, you will be a finance company. So they raised their rates three, four hundred percent as rigid installment payments, which would, of course, fail because no one poor that they allegedly were trying to help. And all of the insurance companies suckered in for that 48 million people the government was going to hand them money for couldn't afford it, no matter how you put guns to their head either, which isn't good for health. Now, if you roll out this with this brilliant lady here, we have websites, this wonderful invention. Uh, she's an expert in that field, I'm more television. And what we do is, as a team, you see it on television. I want to be reckoned. I want to count. I want my life to count. And guess what? You sign up or you say, I'm a member of the Elks, whatever group you're in. Uh, I'd like to join the elk group. Birds of a feather flock together, fine. Uh, some groups drink, some groups don't, you know? There's different ways, some people smoke, some people don't. So you join a group that you think that you're most like. If you're somebody that really thinks they're gonna be immortal and you wanna ride a motorcycle without a helmet and you don't wanna have catastrophic care, when you have that accident, retroactively, you're going to sign something volitionally that says, for the next seven years of rehabilitation, you're going to get that care. And you're going to pay us a higher percentage for a longer time than if 10 years ago, you'd started a retainer with us in case anything goes wrong with you whatsoever, including riding a motorcycle, you get taken care of. But it might be at 1.3% of your income instead of seven because you thought ahead. So there's prepayment, current payment, post-payment, the retainer of an aspect, whether this is for uh, any function you can think of, you have economic incentives, genuine ones, for preventive care, wellness care, and if you do bust that uh, head or leg on a motorcycle, you get rapid long lasting care right there when you need it, or you'll be flown to where uh, neurosurgery can be done. Whatever the cost is, it's covered at a level that you decide and the group decides, and that's called volitional science. 
that's contracts, kisses, that's, that's handshakes. Whereas social science has, has been presented to us is guns, government, uh, all sorts of incentives to do you in and try to make money off of your carcass as you're dying. So we think we've got a winner here and it doesn't involve people having to be too personal in your business. It's somewhat impersonal. You pay a percentage of income, you get your medical care. You don't want catastrophic? Well, okay, maybe you'll need it later. But the group that's paying for what they want will get it. You don't want contraception? Fine. You don't want quality and mortality research? You don't have to sign up for that extra percentage. But hey, you'll be first in line if in five years Stanford cracks the super gene on aging and you look like you're 23 again and so does your brain. So there's all sorts of wonderful things that can happen with a free market, just as early America did, that opened up new frontiers and not at the expense of the Indians. It can be in space, it can be in re-employment insurance. If you're handicapped, you used to be called a shut-in. My first effort with econometrics was to invent with my father, wheelchair locks, air conditioning to the back of a van, get people to job hunting for six months or more as a handicapped person who used to be a shut-in, but now they can get to work and they pay back a retroactive percentage for the job hunting, but they also pay forward a percentage of their income or as the crow flies uh, as they wish for getting to work each day, whether it's a taxi, a charter bus, or a, or a scheduled uh, bus run. All of those things are for human investments and they work. And they're, they're affordable with this system and they're not affordable with any other system. Not any. Or it doesn't cover catastrophic, or it's not comprehensive. And then the socialists win because they say our cycle, our tax revenue cycle will take care of you. Well, we can create a percentage of income cycle. You kind of notice that Medicare for all is based on a percentage of income, 7.2. All right. And it, simple as that. Social Security had another uh, six, seven percent on there. You've got almost 14 percent right there. Think about that. Why are those taxes tolerated? Even if the Congress steals every single penny for 83 years, it's because it rides with the tide. It goes with the flow, boom and bust, trickle and gush. It's an easy tax to pay. It's an easy percentage to pay. So percentage as you earn is what Milton Friedman says. Oh, I like that. That's much better than pay as you earn or pay as you go. Uh, let's let's use that. So in 1976, we started working on that. And we're now culminating it, as the military people would say, live fire in 2021 with this lady right here, wow. Melinda Pillsbury Foster is the chair of Freedom Interactive Television Networks. Health Portal TV is going to bring you the next second, third, fourth quarter of 2021. And I don't think Kamala Harris will have a whole lot to do. When people can compare notes, when they can see other people's lives and see what works and doesn't work, it has an enormous impact. And unfortunately today, especially today, we don't really hear these kinds of stories about other people. We can't ask questions and therefore find out about what they're doing that works. But when we do, it can make an enormous difference. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about giving people the advantage of a free market system. So at a time when we almost lost freedom, we can start to reestablish it. And that's really important. So for every of one of these sort of projects that we're doing, healthcare, uh, loans, you name it, the point is giving people the option to be free, to make that decision and to have the security of knowing that it isn't going to be taken away from them because this system is a safety net for all of us. Melinda introduced me. Let me introduce her a little bit. No. <laughs> FITNA or Freedom Interactive TV Networks Association and Deep Green Futures, which is a for-profit, FITNA is a organization designed to produce two-way mass audience participation television 
with these. 400 million devices are in the hands of Americans in their homes, 4.5 billion of these worldwide. All you need to do is have connectivity companies. She's got them. All you need to do is have data centers. We have them. Oh, by the way, non-censorship and non-surveillance data centers. We also have content aggregation networks to get the feedback from the audience. Like, yeah, I'm curious about that. Tell me more about this percentage as you earn. Oh, yeah, I'm about to lose my house. I'd like to refinance that. Uh, Utah and North Carolina both proven if you stick a roof over somebody's head, uh, you eliminate 91% of other social costs, much of which are pneumonia in the cold in uh, medical problems at emergency rooms. So beyond that, we have media tech companies. Uh, we have 41 different uh, interactive formats, your opinion portals. You want to debate something, the audience can help with a half-baked idea or a three-quarter baked idea. Hey, let, the host says, let's talk about it. Uh, we have phone systems that have, uh, with smartphones, 98% uh, reliability, the VCC.TV, a video call center. There's uh, Zoom is pretty good, but it's 30% reliable. You know, it pixelizes out, and we're lucky to be talking this long, and we appreciate that. Uh, and we can move on to, you know, question and answers whenever the host uh, so direct. But that's basically what we're doing. And Melinda can say a little bit more about how we intend to use mass audience TV with our uh, website signups and so forth. That, by the way, Obamacare spent $240 million on their rollout that way. Uh, we're nowhere near 2% of that. And we'll have a standalone thing that banks, uh, credit unions can uh, interface with. Uh, you pay in by an automatic check. 85% of Americans have automatic deposit already. And then it goes out uh, as a percentage calculation, 9% uh, for your medical care, 17% for your housing, 7% uh, for your vehicle. So all these percentages as you earn become the new norm of finance. And COVID has shown something that in six months, most 62% of Americans are not able to handle six months without losing everything. And the moratoriums that they have on evictions, repossessions, or any other deals going south that allows the banks to be bailed out because they're stupid enough to keep using or smart enough, depending on if you're a predator or not, on rigid installment payments so they can seize stuff. But we don't have to do that. And that kind of world and that volatility and those bank bailouts do not need to exist anymore with percentages you earn. That's what she's doing. Well, Brock, I'm not doing it all by myself. We have a lot of people team. working on this too, though, uh, who they've seen the problem and they've tried a lot of other things and they realize they don't work. And this is the thing that actually can work because what it restores to people is their freedom of choice. And we need that. The free market has almost disappeared from the libertarian movements, very rarely mentioned, but it is the only thing that really keeps us free. It's the freedom to choose for ourselves what we're going to do about problems. Okay. Very good. Well, on that note, let, let us take some questions, in fact, and, and it's interesting what you, what you were saying. I'll chime in here initially. Like, like anything, if I look up that restaurant, the first thing everyone does is they go to the comments. I don't even look at the menu, nothing. I want to see, it was, oh, the place was terrible. There were cockroaches running around there. Eh, I'm not going there. I don't even care what the menu says. So you're right about that part of it. And then the other thing is, if, if I get what I need, mean, so it sounds so funny to a lot of people, like, you're just being greedy. You know, what do you mean I can get what I want? You know, you're greedy. No, not really, because me getting what I want is how innovation occurs. Because if two people say, hey, that's a great way to go, and I do it, and I like it, I tell my friend, the next thing you know, it's the hottest thing since sliced bread. But it would have never been there if everybody else, like you said, Hillary or anybody that ilk dictating, oh, we've already pre-decided you only get this, this, or this. And that's the end. Where's the innovation going to occur? And really the other side too, because in that other world, there are winners and losers. What you're describing there, you two guys, everyone's a winner in that equation. Everyone is a winner. So it's definitely mm -hmm. awesome. So I'm glad you're really kind of, look how long it's taken to kind of come. But you guys thought you were going to get here about 10 years ago, right? But 
it's here. It's gray. So let's get some questions because this is an exciting topic. Charles, I'm gonna let you kick it off. Raise hand. Sure, Jeff. Um, thanks, Brock and Melinda. Great presentation and really intriguing how historical it is with our settlement and, and all the chartered companies. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned the, the British bankers uh, dispensing with it to find some new debtors and going to rigid payments. Uh, assuming it is a good fit in this new normal with so many victims of the, the lockdown that sabotaged so many livelihoods. Uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten from folks that might want to pilot this uh, with certain communities? Um, you know, this sounds a bit like some of the sharing uh, efforts that we've been involved with. Uh, yours sounds just as innovative, if not more. Uh, there, there should be some receptivity from certain folks you've spoken to. To talk about that receptivity. Well, it isn't sharing in the, in the sense that you're talking about. Uh, and as early Christianity, you know, operated, they gave, but people became a part of the community. And what they did was make sure that people were taken care of. But it was not the kind of system that you're talking about here. We are people who are heavily in commerce and we work, we earn salaries, we start businesses. And it needs to be a system that enables um, innovation. And our system today discourages innovation. And that's a problem for everybody. This also, if somebody has the money, if somebody has the time, they've got a great idea, they can quit their job if they have a percentage as you earn loan and they can make that work and the person that they owe money to could be paid off in six months we've all seen that happen with advances in high technology and that can also happen in other arenas one of the things that christians jews muslims uh, share is a respect for an obligation called tithing these uh, great religions also have free will offerings or charity the greeks called it share which meant love uh in in or in the, what we think of as charity uh caritas was the greek word for that of high value you mix them together you get this modern word charity uh, the concept here is you're making a contract to help these other 9,999 people, and they're doing the same for you, come what may. Now, if it's comprehensive, that's very simple administrative. There is not a fixed amount. There's no skip tracing. There's no collections. There's no repossessing your arm. If you happen to get a uh, arm from uh, Dr. Steve Jacobson, uh, to make a living with when you were born without them. I uh, started working with him in 1976 as well. So the, the idea and the good motivations for these innovations, uh, whether it's cracking genetic codes, uh, Stanford tells us we'll probably solve 200 diseases along the way to solving immortality. But yeah, we could do this. How soon? Oh, five to 10 years. Um, how much would that cost? Well, low, maybe if we're really lucky, 10 million, but probably about 100 million. Uh, immortality for $100 million? Good. Let's, we'll put a checkbox on our, our health portal uh, television. Would you like to be first in line for whatever booster spice they come up with? Uh, if you want something or don't want something, again, that's your choice. One size does not fit all. But if you're talking about comprehensive medical care, that's a reality in the free market right here, right now. And it's based on thousands of years of, of interest. Muslims break up their 10% tithing into charity for widows, for orphans, a whole lot of little categories. And that's Dean Ahmad, if you like that, Minaret of Freedom. These kinds of things have a long heritage. This installment payment, this canceling your insurance because, gee, you're suddenly poor. To hell with you. You can die in cold and freeze in the dark. That kind of heartlessness does not win revolutions for freedom. I got news for you. The gratitude that's currently shown to the state will be shown to the free market 
and volitional science if you just give it an opportunity. We need all of you out there with all your skill sets to come forward, fill in some text boxes and say, here's what I do for a living and how can I help? And you can get equity for that, how you can help, okay? Plenty of ways. Very good, that's a good time to our continuing the conversation aspect of the site, so that's excellent. David, I can see your hand up. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, right now, we're preaching to the choir. Uh, Melinda, can you tell us more about how Freedom Interactive TV could be used to reach a broader audience and get the word out about pay as you earn healthcare instead of just preaching to the choir? Well, yes, because everybody is going to have a show that they really want on um, Freedom Interactive TV, which will uh, first launch on Women Leading. You, one of the things we have now is two shows focused on psychopathy, which I don't know how many people here realize is a major problem. But we're also going to have a show called Phones. And the point of Phones, it's a, a show where people can share their experiences with their phone company. They can make a recording, they can tell, show people what their phone company does and how it acts. And uh, then that's gonna have an, start to have an immediate impact on the phone companies. Um, and they're going to want to deny it, but how, who here hasn't had a bad experience with a phone company? It's the same with every other kind of utility. And I wanna point something out. A few people in our world are becoming very wealthy and everybody else is dropping in net worth. And some of us are becoming very, very poor. It looks a lot like medieval England in a lot of ways. And let's go back just for a moment to that rigid installment payment. It was designed by the bankers at the behest of the, the um, you know, the House of Lords to do exactly that. Now, back to, you know, the other issue, what kind of shows do we have? How would you like a show? And we anticipate, given the statistics that we have looked at for how people want and, and enjoy interaction, that many of these shows will have a following of millions of people who follow them exactly the way people follow games today, because they're going to be able to, at the same time, be engaging, playing a game, being, if they do something good, people are gonna find out about it, people are going to emulate it. What are the things that we need done? How about how we remove people from office? How about recall them all? How would we feel if there was that kind of an app we're planning one. Our, our tech guys are working on exactly that. How about a way to vote that can't be hacked? We have one in production right now that will be iVoter. And you're going to see a demonstration of that on another show that we have that will launch within the next two months called, called Recount It Now. And this isn't about politics. This is about having a system of voting that actually is honest and reliable. And we're going to establish what the problems are with the show by looking at what happened on November 3rd of this last year. I think a lot of people are gonna be un uncomfortable with it because a lot of people liked what it did. But I think most Americans are growing increasingly uncomfortable with what happened. Our systems will be secure for either voting or for money. For instance, if we have on our entrepreneurial television network, a medical device segment, and you come up with palm rest canes or color safe IV tubes that are slightly purple, orange, green, depending on what's going into you. And you'd like to have capital for your idea to expand this nationwide. Uh, the idea is that, that people can crowdfund, they can donate, they can buy, they can invest, 
the, the monetary transactions of the 41 uh, forms of interactivity that are entertaining and fun and interesting and engage people's minds, as well as their wallets and their hearts, is what it's all about. So if you want to help somebody or you are part of a rare disease network like NORD, National Orphan Disease Foundation, there's 517 such diseases that very few people have. And every year these people get together and they pool their money to do research on about 10 of them. And next year they do another 10 and kind of keep the other thing going. So there, there's this kind of, of networking of people and networking of television. Now, our data centers can swallow Parler in four hours and have them up. But what we offer is also the audience can rate the crazies, the Nazis, the foreign trolls. They can have competitive ratings criteria. If you're part of the Catholic League of Decency and you're looking at the same movie that the Hustler criteria is on, you're going to get two different opinions of that movie on how good or bad that sexiness is in it or the music or whatever else it is you wish to rate. That's what she's doing as a team leader of many teams. That's amazing. Well, we have people signed up to do it in human trafficking, and that looks really exciting. There are three groups who are actually working on that now that will be coming aboard for that show. Uh, that's what we're doing. We're, we're reaching out to people who actually know it, care about it, have a passion, and already have, think of it as a, a following to make to make it it's to make it real to solve the problem yeah just because we're not interested outlet. in raising money what we're interested in is solving problems yeah, it's great you're creating an outlet where places like all those type of tops important as there don't have a place to go or reside for anyone to ro revolve around them so that's pretty exciting well as it turns out we've got time for one good last question here because lo and behold we've already blown an hour amazing yeah it was pretty quick but it's but it's great to see and again you know, like we've uncovered in every one of these episodes invariably it's always just a handful of people trying to synergize something and then it spins out from there no politician bill got passed none of that never ever so it's it's great to see what you're doing appreciate it for sure thank you for your services they say well, thank you. Well, if you go to freedomtvnetworks.com or pay home, that's P A Y E home.org slash tool hyphen kit, you'll see the history, the econometrics, a glossary of terms. You can come up to speed as good as Milton Friedman or any of the other uh, economists uh, that are all terribly familiar to this choir. And uh, you'll see what each of them said about percentages you earn uh, mutual medical fine insurance. Super. And we're going to make sure those links are in the credits there when we publish the video. So, but again, thanks both of you for being here tonight. It was fantastic. Well, thank well, you thank all you. for listening. Yes, thank Appreciate all of you. It.